Hello and welcome everybody to the Francis Fogel Story Strategist podcast. I am your host, Francis Fogel, and today I have a guest who's special to me in a lot of ways, Joel Mishcon. Those ways will come out the wash as we discuss, but in the first instance, I will introduce Joel as one of the people who I have on this podcast who is an expert in storytelling. The other kind of person I have on this podcast is somebody who I'd like to profile as showing what good looks like insofar as uh, purposeful businesses telling good stories in the world is concerned. But Joel will be talking a lot about that because Joel is a founder of an award-winning, um, it says on your website, which is Chrome, by the way, Joel, not that you don't know that for anyone else, <laughs> an award-winning film, crafting award-winning films and broadcasts for the world's leading brands. I think as a founder of a business, I, I get that that's the headline. There's so much more. There's so much more to Joel. There's so much more to Chrome. I mean, it does say a full service. I, I don't really know where to start. I think where we should start, Joel, is if I... Just explain to everybody here that Joel and I have known each other all of my life. Joel's not that much older than me, but all of my life. And when I was born, Joel, Joel's mum, who is one of my mum's best friends, brought Joel to hospital. And Joel gave me a pink rabbit, called, which I called Pinky. And that rabbit has stayed in whatever bed I've been in my whole life to this day. So you can ask my husband and my children. I didn't know this. Yes. Um, and so my first gift in my whole life was given to me by Joel Mishcon, which I think is pretty amazing. And I've kept it, which I'm very proud of um, and haven't lost it. And what's really um, sweet, you're honoured. <laughs> what's really sweet is I've recently reclaimed my name in um, celebration of this new business. And I saw that in Pinky, Joel, there's... Um, you know, when you were younger, you used to your parents used to sew then your name into things so that you didn't lose it. Oh yes. So it's still got Francis Fogel sewed into Pinky, which I really love. Um, so it's very special. I kind um, of want to see Pinky. Oh, I can go and get it, but then you'll have to talk for five minutes on your own if you're up for yeah, that. Let's not go there. Um, and then just just to say also, so Joel Joel's uh, parents are very close friends of mine. His family are very uh wonderful hopefully some of the stories about his family might come out in this conversation um because I think Joel shares a lot of my sentiments about being inspired by people who've come before you about carrying on names etc um so I'm just hinting at a few things here now Joel I will ask you how do you like to describe yourself and, and what does our relationship mean to you oh wow what a question um well when you've known somebody their whole life which is pretty much my whole life as well I think that's a I think that's a pretty special thing um because we're we're getting on a little bit aren't we Francie let's <laughs> let's face it which is hard to acknowledge but it's uh but it's true um our relationship means a huge amount to me the fact that our mums were best friends um I think is extraordinary we found out that my the little things like this, I think, are important. I found out that my wife, um, our great grandmothers were apparently best friends. And I think that there is something really extraordinary with friendship being passed down through multiple generations. Um, it, I don't think it can be ignored. It's got to be a special thing. So I guess we're kind of like family in a way. We are. And actually, I should just mention that Jolie's sister, Portia, is one of my oldest and best friends and Joel's wife Jodie is also one of my best friends and we were lucky because our parents were part of a big crew of maybe 10 like the inner circle was probably about 10 couples who had grown up together and so we all sort of had this funny community of kids who all grew up together and we were a bit like cousins sort of brothers and sisters I sort of think of you lot as my god brothers and god sisters and I'm I'm close to a few of you still but I think if I saw any of them um so there's maybe like 20 people our age who we hung out with a bit when we were younger I'd feel really safe with I'd be able to tell anything to 
I pick up conversations with, even though I haven't spoken to them or seen them for three years. And there is a sense of community there, wouldn't you say? And there is. I mean, we've been together our whole whole lives, um, you know, not necessarily physically all the time, but I think definitely spiritually, for sure. Yeah. And one of the things that we were very privileged enough to do together when we were younger was to go skiing together. And do you want to talk about how the snow uh, has played a part in your life? I think that's a nice segue into why I've got you on this show, perhaps. Um, sure. The well, the snow really was the was the Kickstarter for for my career for Chrome. So when I was coming out of uni with not really a clue what I wanted to do, I I just knew that I wanted to try and build a career around my passions. And my biggest passion at that time was was the mountains, was snowboarding and and other mountain sports and um and I sort of made a little promise to myself to try and find a career create a career um around the thing that I love the most uh which was the mountains so um so that's what I did I uh I took myself off and I taught myself how to film in the mountains um and you talk about how things get sort of passed down from the generations and the links to those that have come before us. Um, my grandma, when I just had started traveling, um, passed away and, and I came back, um, and I came back for the funeral. Um, and my dad was on a really interesting phone call. And when I was in his office, just sending an email and he said, um, you know, I said at the end, I said, what was that? He says, like, Oh, it's just somebody, you know, giving me a, a hint for an investment. So I said, my grandma just found out had left me, I think three grand uh, in her will. And I said, right, okay, well, I want to, I want to invest two grand into it as I just want to do it. And he was like, don't be ridiculous. What are you talking about? No, keep the money, like save the money. And I said, you've always told me to take risks in life. I want to do this. I'm going to keep a grand. I'm just going to take a punt on this. Anyway, long story short, I did it. I went back to wherever I was, probably living in a hammock somewhere on a beach um, for in Thailand. Uh, and five weeks later, I get an email from my dad saying, call me. So I gave him a call and he said, your investment is now worth 20 grand. And I'm just like, what? I'd literally just been sitting on a beach uh, in a, living in a, living literally out of a hammock. Um, for five weeks and now suddenly I had 20 grand so I thought wow what a this is an amazing gift I told him to sell the shares straight away and uh, and he didn't want to but he but he did and um, and with that money I, I bought a camera and I traveled the world teaching myself how to film um, starting with my friends who were snowboarders um, which then took me to uh, sort of semi-pros um and then I knocked down a few doors uh wherever I was to the point that I ended up filming uh the best snow athletes in the world and um and so really it was my grandma and her generosity to leave me something behind that enabled me to to kick start the thing that I really wanted to do which was to um to find a career based around snowboarding in the mountains so I started uh, a production company um we started making ski and snowboard films and through that we met brands like Oakley and Red Bull uh and then all of a sudden we became known as the the guys that made extreme sports and this was at a time where the extreme sports channel which was on in every sort of bar and club and you know screen anywhere uh it, people were just mad about extreme sports for this period of time uh, we won a commission for them they took us under their wing and and before we knew it we were making sort of 80 percent of of this channel's output we were kids literally I, I was 24 when i started chrome and i started it with two other people um who who have since exited the business but um but we were three kids with a passion who just somehow found a way of doing something that we loved, teaching ourselves to, to just get better and better, saying, yes, we could do things 
when we really didn't have a clue how to do them over and over again, delivering and building a company. And that's 20 years ago, isn't it? 21 years ago. Yeah. Chrome is 21 years old, which is quite incredible. And it's been a journey. I mean, it really has been a journey because when you, I think when you start a business, when you've never worked for anybody else, I had nothing to, I had no sort of um, wisdoms uh, of, of, and, and sort of learnings from anybody else to lean on. I was literally winging it the whole way. Um, and so, you know, I think the journey has probably taken longer than um, I would have imagined, but I also never really set out to grow a business. I really didn't. I set out to, I set out to have to, to do really four things. I had four founding principles when I started Chrome. They're still completely true today. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to meet amazing people. Um, I wanted to hear their stories. Uh, I wanted to have experiences that money simply couldn't buy, connections uh, to things and to places. Um, and I wanted to leave a mark. I knew that I wanted to leave a mark. Um, and that is what I've set out to do with Chrome, not to grow and run a business, uh, which is really what I do now. I just wanted to do all of those things. Um, and and over the last 21 years, my God, it's been such an adventure. And I've done all of those things, you know, on a on a nearly daily basis. Um, and and that's they're still the things that get me out of bed every day. How is it now to have a team of people doing stuff with and for you um it's an honor uh, i i i love the team that i work with um they are an extension of of my family uh, i know that sounds corny but it's it feels very true i spend a huge amount of time with them i have nothing but respect for everybody that works at chrome they teach me things um, and I think that's the that's the number one component to to growing and building a team. I think other than making films, uh, really the only thing that I've had you know the best success at is is finding um, amazing people to work with, um, and getting to work with them every day is extraordinary. So you know here and in the US because we have a US office now. Um, it's just, you know, an unbelievable, I think there's what, 20, 26, 27 people in the business now. So it's not a big company, but they all teach me different things. One about what we do, but also, you know, about life. Uh, everyone has very different backgrounds. Um, everyone has different passions. Uh, nobody is, is anywhere, you know, remotely the same and, you know, but everybody kind of buys into, the overriding mission of Chrome and the journey of Chrome and and we're all on this journey together. I mean, that's the ethos of our business. The ethos of Chrome is that we're all on an adventure together where everybody who's part of Chrome has the ability to touch their full potential. And that for me is about building a team. It's about recognizing uh, when people have untapped potential um, and recognizing when you wanna work with somebody that you feel that you can go on a journey with them and then together, just going on an adventure by combining all of those skill sets and those, and that diverse thinking and expertise um, into, into creating a journey. Still mm. believing that there's a long way to go. You know, we're 21 years, we're 21 years in, but you know, I really, I know it sounds crazy at 21 years, but I feel like we're just getting started. What would you like to see happen? Oh. Um, it's yeah it's that's a great question um because because i always want to keep growing personally um you know and and with the company but growth doesn't necessarily mean just you know numbers um and size growth for me is the ability to work on more and more extraordinary projects uh, to meet more and more incredible people, to tell stories in new, exciting, and innovative, innovative ways, um, and to just keep on building on that, leaving a mark, you know, components. That's um, that to me is growth. So, 
you know, we have a, a little thing or I have a personal mission at Chrome, which is to do something every year that scares us as a company. So it has to scare me. Um, and, and, and with that, it would usually scare most people that work here. But I feel like every year in our growth journey, we've taken on a project where we've had to really figure out how to do it. It could be something that we haven't done before. Um, it could also be something that that nobody has done before they're the projects that we kind of seek out um and um and that's growth for me is is taking on a project every year that scares us and delivering have you chosen the 2024 scary project yeah. no it hasn't it hasn't come yet don't know what it's going to be yeah okay see what, so see what happened well i i want to ask you something else and i don't wish to pry into your politics too much but i'd like to know how you as a person emotionally in terms of your politics um and you know you can also i'd like to invite you to talk about your physicality because you know i stupidly asked you the other day if you wanted to go for a, a trail run with me having forgotten temporarily that you of course have had some pretty major physical setbacks over the years and aren't running at the moment so if you i wonder if you if i could invite you to talk about how that's impacted your personal relationship to the work and where you've been able to travel um but yeah I'm interested to know how the choices that you've made about what you've got involved with bearing in mind you have to be quite discerning in terms of your own time and capacity has reflected how you've changed emotionally politically socially and, and are there any trends that you can uh recognize and that you're happy to speak to and I you know you've done a lot of work in the charity sector and some amazing things uh you've supported wonderful things i wonder if, if you can talk a bit about how what you care about and are passionate about has been reflected in the work that you've chosen for yourself and your team as well um there's a well there's a lot to unpack in in that question um i'm gonna start because i think interestingly the first so so we i think something that we'll get to talk about in this podcast when we talk about storytelling hopefully is is identity um because identity work is a big part of of what we do and it's where storytelling plays a, a really important factor in it we help our clients um with some fairly significant challenges um you know projects that are, are quite complex and we use storytelling to help them navigate that and, and a big part of that is really getting to the the the, the bottom of and the uh, deep understanding of their identity and their culture and, and helping emotionalize that through various means. The reason I say that is because um, we've turned that back on ourselves, that work that we do for other people um, and, and have worked with, you know, an extraordinary person who's become a deep friend of mine, a, a sort of culture and identity expert. And he helped me and Chrome work out our own identity anchors. Um, and I think the first two of our anchors, because we have four. Our, our anchors are kind, edge, agile, and hard. So I'm just gonna, in order to answer your question, I'm gonna focus on on kind and um and agile because I think Chrome really was born out of several acts of kindness. I talk about the one with my grandma. Um, another one was was um was was extraordinary with what happened it gave me a, a it had a sort of really profound effect on me i when i was just starting out uh i'd made it to whistler um and i had about three to four weeks worth of money to be able to make it stick i'd been in new zealand uh, for the season and i really taught myself how to to film properly and i went to canada saying right this is where i've got to make it stick um, and my dad actually came out to meet me for the first week and we spent a week together and we were eating at like, I think it was the Crab Shack in in, uh, in Whistler, went to the bathroom. And when I came back out, my dad was talking to this older couple that were sort of sat next to us. Um, and so I started talking to them and they said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm here. I'm going to try and make it as a as a snowboard filmmaker. I've got three to four weeks to figure it out. And they're like, where are you staying? I said, well, when my dad goes, I'm I'm moving into a hostel. 
when I told them our story. And they said, no, I've literally never met these people. I've spoken to them for about 10, 15 minutes. And they said, well, we've got a place here. We live in Vancouver most of the time, um, but our son lives here. Uh, if you don't mind sleeping on the sofa once every month, you know, one weekend out of every month, then you can have our room. You can stay there until you find something. I'm just like, what? These total strangers just literally opened their lives to me, their home to me. So I took them up on it. And when I moved in um, uh, a few days later, there was a note on the door and it said, Joel was out walking the dog, met this woman, um, this lovely woman, had a great chat. Her husband is this guy um, and he works at a production company. He has a production company, you know, like called Treetop Productions. Um, here's his number. It's just a number. Do what you want with it. And Treetop Productions were my total idol company for snowboard films at the time. And I just strangely been given an opportunity to move into this these people's house and all of a sudden I was just presented with this phone number for the owner of my idol production company I'm just like this is this is just crazy what's happening here these random acts of kindness are just you know really just helping me figure out this path anyway very long story short it took me a long time to meet this person and I drove him nuts until he actually gave me a meeting. And when I got that meeting, he basically told me that I had no hope of doing anything with them because they have the best filmmakers in the world. And who was I? And anyway, whether they felt sorry for me or whatnot, he, as, as I was leaving, I thanked him very much that it was an honor to meet, to meet you. And as I was leaving, he said, oh, and he pulled it out from his drawer, from his desk, uh, a pass, to the Teleski and Snowboard Festival, which was coming up, major event in Whistler. And he said, Look, just go and just film it for me and come back and show me the footage and no promises, no expectations. You know, like, I'll see you in a week kind of thing. And I was just like, wow, this is my first genuine opportunity. So um, very long-winded way of saying that kindness and giving something back has been the number one anchor for chrome and for the journey that i've been on with chrome so we are a commercial business you know we we are in the business to make amazing films uh, but also to make a living um but i think that we also have the ability to have an amazing life while we're doing it and to provide a an incredibly inspiring and supportive environment for the team that works here um, and everybody who's part of our journey so that speaks to your point about giving back um and um and my sort of overriding reflection of i think my personal approach to work um hopefully filtering down to everybody else um in the company the other thing you talk about is 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 injury and physicality, and I think that actually is is probably the first example of where we as a business had to show real agility, um, and that is again another one of our identity anchors, agile, and that comes that came when I injured my back really badly um, when. I was just starting to properly get somewhere. We had made our first ski film. Uh, it premiered in the Warner Village, Leicester Square. We were working for, we were we were in the mountains, like day in, day out, filming amazing tournaments. We were working with the Extreme Sports Channel. I was traveling the world, I, I, like literally filming my idols across multiple sports. We were doing the craziest adventures the Gumball Rally, you know, around the world in eight days. We drove around the world in eight days, you know, and that was a, a, a TV series for Extreme and also for Channel 4 that I got to direct when I was in my 20s. I mean, you know, these were experiences that I could have only dreamed of that were just playing out. And then all of a sudden, just when things were really getting going, I really hurt my back. Um, I needed surgery um, and I was given, I was given 
two options basically uh, i was given the option of of having a lot of metal like titanium discs put in my back um with the understanding or with the insight from the from the surgeons that i was almost too young to to have that amount of metal put in my spine because there just was no evidence that that a spine it was such new technology at the time there was no evidence that the spine could actually endure that kind of um uh, metal support structure um over the years it would be a short term fix but it could cause me problems down the line so they basically said you either got to change what you do you got to change your career and have a and, and accept the fact that you and not going to be able to do what you were doing before which was snowboarding with a 40 pound camera back and huge tripod and dropping cliffs and you know hiking for endless hours in the day you know uh, through waist deep powder like it's, it was all just going to end overnight or i could you know and that's if i that's if i took the long term approach um or i could do a short term fix um that would keep me being able to do what I was doing potentially if the surgery went well, but, but there was, but there was yeah a huge risk for the future. And that was a hard decision because I was just, I was just doing this thing that I had dreamed about. And I, a bit out of character, actually, I chose the long-term fix. I chose to get better the longer way round, to not have the titanium disc put in and to try and take a step back, do less, um, do less of the extreme uh, action, which was yeah, really hurt, hurtful for me at the time. It was a, it was a big loss. Um, and to and to focus on a, on a on a more i guess enduring career for for the future and it was in some ways uh, the best thing that happened to my career because it forced us to become more commercial so we moved from extreme sports into more commercial sports and um and then started working with england rugby and england football and um and you know various other sort of you know uh, safer sports so to speak where i could get better over a, a a number of years um as opposed to to just you know keeping on in the mountains and and actually i'm really pleased we did that because i think we've built a better company for it and i do worry that if i hadn't have chosen that route that i'd still be a perpetual ski bum in the mountains and i'd now be mid to late 40s as i am just in all sorts of agony every day just having to go out and do the thing that i used to love but is now a ball lake because it's the only way i can make a living and now uh, i'm completely healed it took the took well, how long did it take from 2006 when i had my first surgery to three years ago um so you know we're talking about we're talking about a long period of time where i was in a lot of pain um every day uh, but I've managed to heal myself and I now get to go snowboarding again with my kids um, and have a really exciting career and a really yeah. and a really sort of varied and diverse one as well. So you've, you've been able to give uh, birth to Chrome, as you say, as a commercial venture and had to take other people on because you couldn't do it all yourself. And in addition to diversifying your subjects, you've had to let go as a founder and have other people do things for you which you know people listening to this podcast will know very well is very difficult when you've got a passion project or a baby that you've had especially when you're a control freak it's um it's very tricky but but when you do and when you really put your trust uh in your team uh it's extraordinary because that's when that's when the good stuff can really happen um, and I, I've, I've had moments, um, you know, over the years where I've seen a piece of work and I've just been like, oh, I said to my, said to my members, I God, I wish we made this. It's amazing. And then like, we did. Um, or I've, or I've, they've come to me with something and I've said, yeah, you've got to do this. And they said, no, I think we can do that. And I'm just like, do it. But you're like, no chance. And they've gone and done it. And so, you know what, I want to, that I wouldn't, that I wouldn't have been able to do. On that, <clears throat> I want to try and weave some of all of this together because I want you to get onto the power of storytelling more. I want you to, 
uh, tell us, I remember Joel, when your back was terrible, I'm afraid it was, I remember you bending over the boot of a car um, and it was your grandpa's funeral. And um, I seem to remember that on that day, we were all piling into the funeral and your back was really, really bad. And it's making me think about your grandpa. I want you to tell the story of speaking of letting go and getting other people to do stuff for you and taking a step back. There's an amazing story that you can tell about your grandpa um, and washing up and letting other people do it. And I just want to say this is not a political podcast at all, but it's probably worth mentioning that Jolie and I are both peaceniks. Uh, I think we've learned to be so and to be sort of liberal in our thinking from our parents, from our grandparents. And there's a lot to be said in that, which is a whole other podcast in itself, especially at this time in history. But we're not going to go too deeply into that. But I do want you to share the story about your grandpa and about letting go and the magic that can happen when you let other people do things together. And then if you would talk about the story of any other of the amazing companies that you have helped in the way that you described earlier, in t insofar as their own stories are concerned. Uh, yeah, the, um, the the moment you were talking about the, the that that painful day was was my grandpa's funeral and uh and it was it was a week after my first back surgery um i think i'd got out of hospital that day or i was or the day before um and it was a oh it was a brutally cold day i remember it it was like in the it was it was it was really cold and I needed to be there um, and I got myself there, but I wasn't in a good place. And my body went into all sorts of sort of physical shock. I remember I ended up, oh, it was awful. I ended up just lying in the back of a car, just literally just my body was just shaking because it, 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 it had just it wasn't ready for that cold. It wasn't ready for the emotional stress. Um, post-surgery and too many things were happening at this point I suppose in my life you know and um, it was a it was a tricky year uh, in many ways um, I think it was the first that was the first real realization that that I wasn't physically in control of myself anymore um, and that that I would have to find other ways I'd, I had felt invincible up until that point and I believed that even with surgery, I would be absolutely fine and I'd be able to to defy what the doctors said and, and get back to um to all of the things I wanted to do. And I, I guess that was a very physical, uh, it was a, a physical and an emotional uh acceptance of loss, um, all packaged into into one moment. Excellent fodder for for storytelling uh down the line. Um because I think lived experiences are the greatest tool that we have to be able to to tell uh, emotionally rich stories. And if you don't go through, if you don't go through things like that, if you don't have lived experience, I always wonder how young writers can achieve what they um, have what are able to achieve. Um, I always think of young writers as as being just exceptional talents when they are able to write about things that they've never actually experienced in ways that you where you where people who have experienced them can see the truth and can feel the and can feel the pain um but that's the gift of, of storytelling uh, i think to be able to to translate and retell uh, and to capitalize on um lived experience no matter how good and and beautiful uh or or or, or traumatic and um, and adverse um so yeah i i uh, leaving a mark is speaks to my grandpa you know this is what i think you're trying to get at uh um i my grandpa was a was an extraordinary man um and he left a legacy um uh, his legacy is 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 many things, uh, but one of the greatest achievements um, that he made was was brokering the peace deal between Israel and Jordan, 
um, back when he was a lawyer and a good friend to Shimon Peres, who was the then Prime Minister of Israel and King Hussein of Jordan. And he, he said to both of them, he's just like, if I could just get you in a room, I know that you'd be able to see sense and you'd be able to thrash it out. And this is when relations between Israel and Jordan were, 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 were very fractured. Um, and uh, this is a wonderful story, but I'm going to have to keep it very short. He managed to convince them to travel to his little thatch cottage in Hampshire, um, where he promised that he promised them that nobody would be there. He'd make sure the gardener wouldn't come in that week. Um, and he said, well, let's just go and spend a few days there. Um, and whether this is true or not, this is the story that I've been told. King Hussein arrived um, in disguise and because of his, you know, if, if if the Jordanian people had known that he was going to be going and meeting the prime minister of um, of Israel, uh, it, you know, it would have it wouldn't have been a, a pretty thing and and vice versa. And anyway, those three men, my grandpa, King Hussein and Shimon Peres spent a week in a thatched cottage surrounded by fields in Hampshire thrashing out what would then become the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, which I think probably until the Jerusalem Accords, you know, recently were, you know, the major step forward in um, in Middle East, uh, in the Middle East peace process. Um, and so anyway, my grandpa was, was, was able to really leave a mark and, and I will never be able to leave um, a mark as deep uh, as the mark that he made because because the work that he did was it, it it changed people's lives literally um for for the better he had a huge impact on humanity uh the only mark i'm going to be able to make um is to is to hopefully be able to bring uh, my form of of art to to people and and create a, a sort of an emotional um response um in them be it through joy or um trying to help them learn something about themselves that they didn't already know uh which again i think is is one of the essences of storytelling um and and that is unfortunately the only legacy that I'll be able to leave but we've all got to do something Francie we've all got to do something thank you yeah I couldn't agree more Jolie um you know when I was very pregnant with this new business um what happened in Israel not long ago happened and for the month after that I thought who am I little Francis white middle class Francis in London who's wanting to help people with glamping sites in Sussex or vineyards, people sitting on a gold mine of amazing stories who've had to kind of repurpose their businesses to be clear about their own heritage and story of change and the shadow side of things and help their people and help themselves and help the world. Who am I? And then I thought, it took me about a month to process these feelings of shame and imposter syndrome. And then I realized that that is all we can do. All I can do is help one small, you know, B and B somewhere in Kent or whatever, you know, to tell a better story. That's probably all I'm going to be able to do as a citizen of the world. And similarly, you know, of course, your grandpa, you know, no pressure on you. But, you know, we're all doing our small bit together. And um, I just want to loop back to something you said, which I'd I say about. I'm just going to interrupt you and say yeah. that I think you're underselling yourself there a little bit because... Because you're ignoring the domino effect, um, which is that the business that you help, the person, the founder, whatever member of the team you are helping achieve something is then going to create, hopefully, uh, a, a better experience for all of the people that will interact with that business. Um, mm -hmm. And those people will then go off and, and achieve you know other things and do other things uh, you know b influenced by the experience that they had and i think you know you you talk about you know you're you're going to and you are helping multiple people and multiple businesses and each of those individuals will just spread out um into the masses 
my grandpa was helping two people. He just like, they happened to be two quite important people, but essentially he just helped them see eye to eye. And that had a domino effect that 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 splintered out across the nation. So I wouldn't mm. say it's short. Yeah, no, thank you. And yeah, that's the idea, um, but not so much the domino. So the idea being for anyone who's listening to this podcast episode and is new to what I would like to give to the world, I'd like to help purposeful businesses, founders in particular, leaders of those businesses to uh, do four things better using storytelling uh, to sell their products so they make more money um, in an ethical way. So marketing in an ethical way um, to help their people feel more engaged. And I'm quite particular about not saying employee well-being, but employee engagement, because I feel that they have a part to play in the story, as Joel has kind of uh talk to today um and feel more significant in the words of Seth Godin in his book The Song of Significance about the workplace a new manifesto for teams definitely recommend it um and also I talk about customer loyalty so not retention but loyalty a sense of an emotional sense of belonging in the community of a business and community care and that is to say giving back in the world so one of the businesses that I've recently talked to interviewed on this podcast is Home Farm Glamping in Hertfordshire I was mentioning to Joel who um, the founder of which inherited an amazing piece of land in Hertfordshire and needed to repurpose it needed to pivot started a glamping site has you know given so much back to the environment in so far as hedgerow health is concerned and now runs amazing corporate workshops around hedgerow environmental maintenance um and runs an amazing website so yes i want to help organizations do all that but to your point joel a member of staff who might will then be giving back to the company and feeling really significant in the company has a family has friends has their own causes that they care about and the domino the domino effect is much bigger than i can ever be in any way involved in but i can only hope is going to be present um I'm sure that you've got examples of how this happens. And I wanted also just to loop back to something you said earlier, which is, so when I was at, at art college, when I was uh, 19, I looked around the studio and I thought, we're a load of students being asked to say something about the world through our art, but we don't have anything to say because we haven't been in the world. And that's what made me then go to university and study cultural theory and sociology, because I felt I had to learn about the world before I could come back to my art and have something of meaning to say. And I didn't know at the time that that was quite a left-leaning sort of neo-Marxist view of what art should be for the people. And you talk about the masses, um, but it turns out, I think both you and I are in the business of using art to kind of educate and to, and actually one of your most amazing projects is, do you want to talk about in the art world? Are you allowed to name drop? Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah? sure. Yeah, please, please. I'm just waffling on now, but tell us about that piece of work and storytelling in relation to that, because that's a nice random segue and makes what I just said look relevant to the conversation. I, I, are you referring to uh, what, are you referring to Sotheby's? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because um, that's a bit well, tangential. You've just been talking for ages about extreme sport, right? So how does that yeah, come into it? Well, you so you started by asking a question about um, about the, about team and and how being part of something um is is actually you know is really important i don't want to i don't want to move away from that too much i'll come back to the i'll come back to the art world okay. stuff okay okay um because because it's it's really interesting but let's stick with the first thing you asked because um because i think you've touched on something really important um and i talk about the team here and you know being part of something but storytelling this is exactly what i believe you're trying to do you're trying to say that that you can use effective storytelling for either trying to sell something or to um incite some form of behavioral change in somebody um you can use storytelling to increase performance you know there's there's so many usages for effective storytelling um i think the 
the I can I can talk about a couple of examples where a, a film that we've made starts with the team, but then has a, a huge sort of knock on effect beyond it. Um, the so I'll start with one. I'll start with a project that we did for Ford a motor company and it was actually the first time we'd worked with Ford we this it kickstarted an amazing um, relationship I think it's about seven years old now where where we've um where we've done some some really incredible projects together but the first project that we ever worked on was was a pretty fascinating one because Ford had a, a challenge um where they were coming back to Le Mans you know the 24-hour endurance race after 50 years they hadn't raced there 50 years they won it. They came first, second, and third um, in the sixties, and then they and then they and they didn't compete in it since. And yet they were coming back to this race after fifty years, um, and they had an issue because the two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand people that worked for Ford, some of them got it, but the majority of them who might not have been receiving pay rises or bonuses or you know, or whatever it might be, were just seeing this company, their employer, spend gazillions on this race program, on taking on this race. And there was a huge sort of problem uh, internally about the optics of, of why Ford was, was deciding to do this. So we had just made a film for England Rugby, which was a, a, an identity and a culture film um, that I'm also going to talk about. And actually, that film led to um, it led to this project with Ford because the director of communications um, for Ford of Europe saw the rugby film that we made and realized, OK, this could be the answer to our problem. We could use storytelling here in a, in a way to help our, our, our to help our workforce understand why Ford goes racing, because there's a real reason behind it. And that was literally the brief that we were given. Can you emotionalize why Ford goes racing? Um, and you know, that's a it's a pretty, it's a it's a pretty tough brief because it's quite it's quite general. Um, but being able to unpack it um and to be able to create a short film that was originally designed for the employees. Um and that's exactly what happened. We made this film, we delivered it. Bill Ford emailed it, which he'd never done before, to every employee at Ford, and then all of the out networks as well. So the the dealers, um, you know, beyond that. Um, and he did it at the start of the race weekend, and he said, "This is why we're going racing this weekend, and this is how you can support us." And so what was designed originally as a film for the employees then became a film that everybody connected to Ford outside of the company that still that sold Fords or provided parts for Ford was also sent so they could have a real understanding of, of why Ford goes racing. Um, and then beyond that, it went out into the world via YouTube and other social media channels. And the comments that we got back were just extraordinary. This is why I drive a Ford. This is why I'm the fifth generation that owns a Ford. This is why I work for Ford. And we told a story, we'd emotionalized why Ford exists. Ford was actually born um, in, in racing. Uh, that's how Henry Ford got the money to actually build his first car was by building his own vehicle, by it in his own hands, entering it into a race and winning it. Um, and with that, he the money he got from that, he used to start the Ford Motor Company. So um, lots of other components to it. But but you can see a film that was designed originally for 200,000 people suddenly became a, 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 you know, a an example to everybody that either has owned a Ford, does currently own a Ford or is thinking about owning a Ford to really understand more about the company. Um, not only that, but it was also watched at Le Mans on a big cinema screen with all of the drivers and the engineers and the marketeers and everybody involved in that race before going out to qualify. Um, they all stood around and they watched it. And um, I wasn't there. I got a wonderful message afterwards um, 
from from our client uh, and one of the things they said was that one of the drivers turned to her and said i can't wait for my family to see this i think maybe they'll get it for the first time and um and so you know, they and they went on to win after 50 years they came back and they and they won um so again you know it's it's amazing how a film with one purpose can can take on many different lives so that was a film that had a purpose it wasn't selling anything it was actually trying to help a company solve a problem or a challenge um the rugby film that we'd made that inspired that film was was a film that we made for the england rugby team um and just the england rugby team only the england rugby team at the time have, have seen this film um but it, it was but this but again the brief was challenging so this was when Stuart Lancaster was the head coach and he was really trying to rebuild the culture of the team. It needed a lot of help. Um, and he realized a couple of things, two things. One, a lot of the players that played on the England rugby team weren't actually born in England, but they were representing this country, this nation. But England's actually quite a tricky entity or country to celebrate um, or to truly sort of understand in the context of Great Britain and the United Kingdom. When you really just focus on England, it, it can be very, it can appear very nationalistic. You know, that's an issue that, that Eng England has. So all of a sudden you've got this team that are literally going to be going out and putting everything on the line. I mean, everything. Not really understanding who or what they're playing for. And the brief we had was, can you make a film that helps our team understand who they're playing for? And also, while we're doing that, understand the weight of the shirt, this time in the shirt that they have, this shirt that has been worn by only an elite few people before and only an elite few people after really are going to have the opportunity to wear that shirt. And when you talk about storytelling, you know, how do we pull off something like that? Um, so we did what everybody should do when confronted with a brief like that. We turned to Maori philosophy. I mean, why wouldn't you? Um, and and we did that because the person that bought us this project was this, I mentioned him earlier, this incredible guy, Owen Eastwood, who has written a book, by the way. He's a great friend of mine um, now, but he's written a book called Belonging which I urge everybody to read. It is an extraordinary book about team culture um, and about identity. And anybody who is looking to improve um, their team culture or, or, or build a, um, a, a company and an effective team should read this book. It's amazing. Anyway, Owen was the performance coach. And he also happens to be an identity and a culture expert who was helping Stuart Lancaster. And he is... Uh, he's he's uh, he's from New Zealand and he's Maori descent, um, and he uses deep Maori philosophy to guide um, his thinkings. So we were tasked with taking this report that he'd done and essentially turning it into um, a a human uh, um, a, a, a human um, telling of the story or like uh, humanizing this uh, this report. And when he told us about these Maori philosophies, um, it really started all making sense to us. And it's something that has filtered through so much of the identity work that we've done since. Um, and it's and some of these things are beautiful. Uh, I don't know if we've got time. Do we have time? Do I have time? To I tell mean, you? I, I think what we're going to do, Joel, because it's it's actually time to stop talking in a second, uh, which for me is hard. Um, I would like to carry on um maybe we'll do yeah let's carry on and i can make this into a two-parter why not um if you're up for it uh i'm up for it i'm up for it i've, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've obviously i've obviously talked way too much no no it's, this is a problem and both of us well this is i mean we could talk about editing as well and sort of do you need to let it all out before you then edit it back you know that's a really interesting subject in itself um, I want to say, may I just segue before you go on yeah. um, and just say, 
I'm very moved by what you're saying. And I was only saying to someone on a call just before I spoke to you, I'm really, I've had to be very careful about not seeming like a Brexiteer because one of the things that I, so my story of, one of the stories that informs this business is that my, I have one child who has, as you know, Joel, but for anyone who doesn't, um, I have one, my youngest son has multiple severe life-threatening allergies, food allergies, and that it has limited us um, in so far, in a few ways, um, as you can imagine. But one of the things is that we haven't gone abroad uh, since he was born, uh, mainly because we just can't be bothered because of the rigmarole of having to explain all the allergies in a foreign language or, you know, the stress of it and then thinking about the 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 economics of, you know, do we want to sort of self-cater if we're about all sorts of things. So we've decided, and also Brexit, sorry, COVID <laughs> and Brexit to some degree, um, all, of all of the things uh, and money, try having two children, um, full stop. Uh, and it's just stopped us from going abroad. So what I then did when I realised we weren't going to be going anywhere for quite a long time was got absolutely obsessed with uh, glamping and l luxury cabins in the UK and just... I've become Alistair Sorday and Canopy and Stars number one. Um, in fact, it was all started, Joel, by another couple in our community, Jane and William, who for our wedding present, Rudy and I, got us a night in this mad treehouse cabin uh, in uh, Norfolk. And I think that kicked off my obsession with cabins. So since then, I've been dragging my husband and children around all of the cabins. And I realised, therefore, that we were being very environmentally friendly by staying in the UK. Uh, so a large part of my business is about celebrating the UK, about trying to get people to stay maybe one in every two times that they consider going abroad and to kind of celebrate the amazing landscape and the beautiful things. I mean, like you, Joel, I'm a, an adventurer and I love my running and my trail running and my all the rest of it being outside. And I've just really enjoyed being where I'm from. Um, and I'm just loving what you're saying about the rugby team film, because, you know, I'm similarly wanting to help founders to kind of navigate. And I talk about talking about the shadow side of stories because there's so, I mean, storytelling is not unique. Everybody in the world of marketing is talking about it. What's different about what I'm trying to do is apply the stories to not just marketing and sales, but to all the other things, as you say. But there's also the shadow side of all those stories that needs to be processed by founders as opposed to greenwashed or made shiny or just ignored. And being in Britain, there are, as you say, quite a few things to navigate um, about this country. So I just wanted to relate that to yeah, what I'm doing. I think that um, I think that you've touched on a really interesting uh, aspect of of our industry, which is, uh, and this speaks very much to the work that you're doing, which is about doing work for good and being as um, as sustainable uh, as we can possibly be as as an industry and and you know and taking on our you know, our individual responsibilities for doing that. You talk about not being able to leave the UK. I think what, what's so interesting about how our industry has evolved and is continuing to evolve is where technology and storytelling meet. Because when the two, when those two things collide, really extraordinary things can happen. Um, and there's a new technology called virtual production um, that we have utilized uh, multiple times now um, uh, which really enables us to be just as bold as we would usually be in our uh, in in the sort of the grandeur of the of the projects that we want to create and the sort of complexity of the creative within them to take us to places all around the world that would usually cost a fortune and would leave a really damaging um footprint uh in terms of carbon from having to fly crews uh, around the world or travel you know multiple vehicles um as units uh, across different countries and continents to be able to actually 
create very global productions, but all from a studio in England, um, you know, in Ricelip, like around the corner. Um, so that's a technology that we've been using recently um, and a, a couple of, of jobs that we've done where we've been able to, you know, one of our clients is Standard Chartered Bank. Um, they, are a, they, they are probably the most global bank uh, and they wanted to showcase their 14 sort of markets um, and sectors uh, around the world. So it's 14 countries, three continents, um, but they wanted to do it in the most sustainable way because that is what their manifesto is as a bank. So we were able to create a film using this technology that had over 100 cast in it um, that literally traveled to 14 countries. Um, but we shot it in five days in a studio in London. Um, and if you watched it, you'd uh, you'd have absolutely no idea that that some of those environments had been made using photo real CGI. Some of them were just plate shots that had been shot by a local crew with one camera. Um, and yet we were able to create a truly global production in a in a very sustainable way. So I'm excited about you know being able to one achieve amazing things without leaving the country, even though that's also a sad thing because going back to one of the reasons why I got into the business, it was to travel. Um, I personally think with the amount of content that is needed these days and the importance of video, I don't think we're ever going to lose that need and that necessity to travel. Um, but if we can, if we can complement that travel with other productions where we don't travel, but achieve the same effects, then we are then we're doing something um we're doing something that's going to really help and i should just say at this juncture i'm not sure when we are going to actually finish this conversation but one of the other things i want to make clear through this podcast is and series of conversations is that i invite founders to employ me to help them but what i bring also is a network of experts and depending on what a company the founder needs any number of the people over the years who I have gathered could come in um, and help so a number of people that I've interviewed on this podcast are the kind of people like Joel who if it turns out an amazing film is required I can wheel in and then I've got people who are coaches because I run a community of coaches as well at my fingertips I have copywriters I have uh people who specialize in uh, improv theater um, who can come in and run workshops. And I have assistants of all kinds uh, who I can roll in to help me. And that's, that's part of what I hope to bring into this world of storytelling that I'm trying to create. So um, I just wanted to make sure to get that sell in for Joel and also to just say, Joel, I hope you'll share um how people can find whatever film if you had to recommend one thing of chromes that you would want everybody to see what would it be and where would they find it oh my god that's a really hard one um i mean by all means visit our website uh um chromeproductions.com uh, i think a, a film that really speaks to to who we are um that's public because some of our proudest work has been for sports teams um England football um and England rugby uh and and various other sports teams where we've made films that are only film only watched by them before going out and playing in major um competitions or games or tournaments but um the films they're not public but I suppose the film that is public that really speaks to who we are is is a film called Our Time um it was a film that announced uh, Ford's return to Formula One, um, which is a film that we made last year. And I've talked a little bit about the legacy of Ford in racing, but Ford coming to Formula One, teaming up with Red Bull Racing, it's a huge thing for the sport and for the company. Um, and Ford asked us to help um, with the reveal film, the announcement film. Um, and Again, it was a it was a very loose brief, 
but it was a very exciting project because we needed to honor what Ford brings to the world. And uh, in terms of legacy, there aren't many companies that that have a legacy like Ford. So we needed to package that legacy into a human story and then bring in all of this other information around it, you know, the, the sort of the facts and the um and the and the real sort of information. But we did it by creating a an emotional hook in the form of a story and um, that just drew people in and and then took people you know on a journey. It was a journey that you could see played out across a movie um but it just so happened that it was something that had to play out across two and a half minutes and that is um you know that is the exciting thing about what we do is you know especially with storytelling um is that you don't need to abandon uh the uh, the 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 foundation um and the process of story craft when you're making short films um it's it's not exclusive for movies and, and episodic content you can create a deep emotional connection with a viewer um in a very short space of time if you use effective storytelling so i think so if you go onto our website probably in the auto section our time for ford that will hopefully speak to uh trying to create that emotional connection to help people understand the significance of Ford wanting to do this thing. Thank you, Joel. I mean, we haven't had time to talk about the Sotheby's thing, but if you do go on the Chrome website, you'll get a sense of the broad range of organizations that um, Chrome has and is able to work with. Um, I wanted to, I do want to round things off, Joel, and I'm going to ask you a, a kind of, tough love question to end things um as a founder uh you're speaking about yeah having to go on a journey and I work with founders who may be thinking about how to keep going or maybe thinking about yeah the sustainability of their business uh and they might be thinking about stepping away leaving a legacy themselves thinking about their own story and you've talked about how yeah the 21 years of Chrome and 21 years of Joel. And also, I'm really sorry, but the elephant in the room is second life, second mountain, middle life crisis, man, thinking about 50. You know, what does that all mean for you on an existential basis? Where are you? I'm Where living my best life now. I am literally having the most catastrophic midlife crisis. Uh, I, I've, I've just, I've got back into skateboarding um, I've bought a one wheel, which is this brilliant electric skateboard that I'm hooning around London. I've like, honestly, I'm just, I'm, I'm snowboarding it. I've, I've never felt as good, um, and uh, and as I think as as happy and as fulfilled as as I am at this point in my life. Uh, it doesn't mean that the stresses of running a business are, are, are not there. They are ever present and ever increasing as the business grows. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the life that it's given me and the people uh, that it has allowed me to share that journey with. Um, I think when you run a business, moving to the first part of your question, when you run a business, uh, there are so many factors, so many things you need to be thinking about. Um, you are living in the moment, but um, but you are really way, way ahead in your in your mind. Um, and you really need to be thinking about your journey where you want to get to, um, as well as all of the sort of hurdles and the negatives um, and the adversity that could get in the way of that journey. Um, and and riding that fine balance between risk and uh, and uh, comfort um, and security is you know i think for for anybody that is running or growing a business is the it's the hardest um tipping point to to stand on um because you know when do you when do you keep investing when do you pull back 
Um, we are in such a precarious uh, time uh, in not only in our industry um, with all of the evolutions that are happening with technology like AI and what that might bring, um, you know, to the, the changes that that might bring to our industry, but also just what's happening in the world and how that might affect uh, our clients and their appetite to spend um, and to and to keep communicating in the ways that they are. I mean, so many factors. So, so you know, living very much in the moment, and and also, uh, you know, a few years down the line, or in some ways, many um, years down the line, is uh, it's a it's an interesting space to occupy. But it's great. Uh, thank you, thank you, Joel. You you know, wind the clocks forward. You'll probably find Joel and me and our families living in an old age home at the age of a hundred. Joel and I will be. Uh, Can it be in the what? Will it be in the mountains? It'll be well, no, because probably Jody won't last going in the mountains. No. But you'll find that Joel and I will be skateboarding in the garden, uh, or doing some other crazy stuff that hundred-year-olds should not be doing. Um, Rudy will we'll... be on the decks, and Jody will be oh, yeah. dancing. Rudy will be away. DJing exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you. I hope we're friends forever. We will be. In this life, and we've come this lives. far, so we might as well see it out. I reckon. Yeah, let's just keep going. Um, I love you. I love um, what you're doing, Francie. I, uh, I'm, I'm in great awe of this, of, um, of, of this newfound, uh, just desire, um, to use all of your experience, everything that you've kind of mastered along the way, um, packaged up into into becoming this sort of expert story strategist. I think it's a I think it's a great concept. If you talk about everybody, you know, storytelling being a buzzword. I mean, it, it, we don't even need to think of it like that. Storytelling has you know, it dates back to Aristotle. Uh, it's it's nothing new. It is the greatest component that we have, the greatest tool that we have to connect anything to anybody. Um, and, you know, so that's where it filters into marketing and all aspects of art. So for you to be using your experience to be able to, to help guide um, other founders um, and, and leaders um, and companies uh, on their journey, uh, I think is absolutely brilliant. So I love the I love the words on your website. I love what you're doing. I'm very honored that you asked me to to be part of this podcast series. Um, alongside such yeah, some other really you know, fantastic people and speakers, which I've really enjoyed listening to. Thank you, Jolie. I'll um, I shall see you anon. And uh, thank you everybody for listening. And do check out ChromeProductions dot com. Lots of love. Bye bye.